this week on the nonprofit news feed, or should I say probably the AI nonprofit news feed? There are a lot of updates. This is a very focused session on what we're seeing in the nonprofit sector and AI. Of course, my name is George Weiner. I am the chief whaler of Whole Whale, and we have Nick Azoulay, who runs our digital strategies over at Whole Whale. Nick, thanks for joining us. I don't know if there's any, we usually kick off with a little like, what's new at Whole Whale? I don't know, what's what's new for you? George, that's a great, a great thing to, to mention. We're still recruiting for our ad grant cohort. So if you're an organization that would like to learn more about utilizing the ad grant, please go ahead and sign up. And I think, George, just update from the company side is we are really closely following the rollout of SGE, or formerly known as SGE, now known as Google Search Overview, which we'll be talking more about in depth today. So it's been an all hands on deck effort to put our brains together and try to find out what's happening and make the most of it for our clients. But with that, we can go right into our top story because George, as you said, today will be the day of AI. And we want to start uh, by talking about an article from the Chronicle of Philanthropy from its June cover story, uh, which wrote on a new generation of AI nonprofit, changing how organizations are tackling issues and social challenges. So one of these organizations is Quill.org, which is transforming classrooms by providing interactive exercises and personalized feedback. And if you actually park back to OpenAI's demonstration just a couple weeks ago, Khan Academy has also partnered with OpenAI to do similar, uh, to, to create similar programming for using generative AI to help students learn methodically in a way that helps them not just recite, not just memorize, not just one dimensional videos, actually interacting and teaching students, helping them when they go wrong, um, iterating on their work and helping them grow at their speed. Uh, and I have to say, George, this is just tremendously exciting. If any anyone listening has teaching experience, differential learning, teaching students across different learning abilities, capabilities, paces, speeds is really, really challenging. But AI allows students to learn at their own pace in a way I don't really think has ever quite been possible like now. So that's an exciting development. The article also highlights an organization called Justice Lab, which has developed AI-powered chatbots and translation tools to help immigrants navigate the labyrinthine legal processes of applying for asylum and, you know, getting documentation status within the United States. Our immigration system is unequivocally complex. You, it's nearly impossible to do unless you have a lawyer. So a really cool application there. There's other organizations like Fair Bio, which is using AI to work antibiotics work, the contingent, which works with foster parent recruitment. So George, we're seeing, I think, the beginning of the age of AI nonprofit, nonprofits that are per putting AI products first as a means to social change. What does this mean for the nonprofit industry? And what does this mean for organizations that might feel maybe a little bit of pressure to start learning what all the fuss is about? Well, traditionally, the sector are late adopters, and that may be generous, where it is, you know, well well past launch and adoption and late adoption, where nonprofits say like, well, wait a minute, this is not going away. And also, to be fair, is this safe? Is this safe for our data? Is this safe for our stakeholders? Uh, and some of these projects, you know, pose a lot of exciting upside, but we'll also be seeing, of course, the critiques and backlash when when and if some of these projects go wrong or saying, well, wait a minute, isn't AI supported education only helping students with one access to this type of bandwidth and tool? Isn't this better for self-directed learners? Is this going to extend the gap in education that we already have seen? On the other side, it's going to hopefully accelerate and assist teachers, which I don't think I've ever met a teacher who couldn't use an assistant. And this is that if it's built correctly and used under the guidance of the teacher. If we get more hours from our educational professionals, I think good things happen because it's under their discretion to distribute those. So uh, I think there's a lot of upside and frankly, some of the grading and reporting and task paperwork overload that 
teachers are asked to do, and there's a lot uh, that can be done there. So I am more, uh, I'm more excited when we're talking about improving the internal systems first before exposing AI for external unsupervised AI interventions. Yeah, George, I think that's fair. Something we talk a lot about at here at Whole Whale is the ethical implementation of AI. And with any new technology, there's tremendous upside, but there are also tremendous risks, right? When you deploy new technology to society that's not yet been inoculated to the downstream negative. So just moments ago, we talked about, you know, AI used by students, um, but you and I were having a conversation where we were talking about gender harms. Students have actually been using AI deep fakes to make deep fake news of, of their students, right? So of course, that's the different tooling than Khan Academy or whatever. But as with any new technology, we have a responsibility as a society to make sure that the implementation of that is safe and ethical. And I think we're at an inflection point where we can't ignore this anymore. AI is here, it's here to stay, and it's important now that we have the tools, the language, and the resources to think about how we can use this technology safely, how to deploy it safely, how to communicate that to our communities, our constituents, both internal and external, to, to create kind of a safe adoption going forward. Yeah. Well, our next story uh, is a quick one on OpenAI launching a nonprofit, AI for nonprofit, finally, as a nonprofit, by the way, remember OpenAI was founded as a nonprofit, put a pin in that, and we've talked about that in the past, has a new pricing tier for nonprofits that you can apply for at a $20 per seat instead of the $25 or $30 per seat per month costs of that tool. I, I think this is a good start. This is at least a start and an acknowledgement that nonprofits need access to the higher tier of these tools. If you're not paying for the tool, if you aren't paying for the product, you are the product. We have learned this. We'll learn this again. And it is incredibly important that you begin to choose a tool that is paid for and trusted internally because your team has already chosen if you haven't. The Microsoft at Work Trends survey came out across the board. We talked about this in the past, that 70% or more of all staff that they interviewed are using AI and they're calling it BYO, you know, bring your own AI to work. We don't want that. That's where mistakes happen. That's where data is leaked in weird ways to training models. So I, I like this acknowledgement that nonprofits have, you know, can go to ChatGPT. There are others like Anthropic.com, which I also really like. And of course, causewriter.ai. We custom build these things for our clients, for ourselves, with our own access to APIs that makes sure our data isn't leaked out there. And we have built on brand with relevant information, things that are trained for us, not on us. Yeah, George, I think that that's so important. And if you're an organization looking to learn more, definitely go to openai.com slash index slash introducing openai for profits. And as of now, it appears that this is open to, quote, Academic, medical, religious, or governmental institutions, those are not yet open for uh, nonprofits for AI, but nonprofits themselves are open anywhere else in the world. So as long as you're not an academic, medical, religious, or government institution, and you're a nonprofit, you can qualify. Typically, these programs require C3 designations or tax designations. It seems like they're being kind of broad in this, and they don't contact them. Contact sales to learn more. All right, George, and I'll take us into our next and last story for this segment, but that is that Google's search overview has gotten Google in a little bit of trouble. So as reported by The Verge and others, the recent rollout of Google's AI overviews feature has generated a series of viral now, bizarre and inaccurate responses to some user queries. In one instance, the, the new feature recommended adding about one eighth cup of Elmer's glue to pizza sauce to the cheese from falling off. And apparently this advice came from a decade old Reddit comment. So Google doing what it does, scouring the entirety of the internet, but surfacing some wacky results. But 
these kind of viral responses got so much traction, especially on platforms like Twitter, that Google's head of search had to release a statement downplaying concerns saying, hey, these are like really, really kind of like niche searches. These are people looking to break it. That being said, it still raises some concerns. And the New York Times noted that AI search overview had been turned off for some of the more egregious, egregious hallucinations, having people like eat rocks, that kind of thing. So George, I will say this was not the first time Google's had a little bit of PR trouble from kind of bizarre behavior from AI models. There's the infamous um, New York Times story where he convinced it an early version of Google's Bard to fall in love with him. You know, he went fishing for that. You can kind of, you know, think about that while you may. But either way, it's creating a little bit of a PR struggle for, for, for Google. What do you think about this? Are the concerns overhyped? Are they serious? I think it's clear that search overview is here to say. What's your impression? I think it's pretty clear that the level of desperation at this company is high. To make this scale of just broken product, and not just broken, straight up dangerous, and then come out with a statement that is essentially, I'll just summarize you the what Google came out with is a little sprinkling of got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, and then also claiming fake news on some of these things. At this point, the amount of sort of screenshots and proof of what's going on of like people cherry picking things, I get it. If you're talking about fruits that end with, and it comes up with apple, banana, stra strawberry, um, like that's pretty funny. You're like, okay, you're like clearly just trying to trick this AI. But what if you're searching for something like how to pass a kidney stone quickly? And instead of a, I don't know, medical organization, you chime in with drinking a bunch of lemon, lime, soda, fruit juice, or maybe just drink urine every 24 hours. Okay, that's confusing. And frankly, I'm, I'm excited for the changing of the guard with regard to the companies that own the access to information that have strangled controlled, changed the rules for the past decade plus. And, you know, we can shake our fist at the sky. We're preparing our clients for how to readjust for AI-driven search and completion, but I'm deeply disturbed by how Google has rolled this out, has communicated with a new level of callousness, I think. Uh, and sure, maybe some of these are made up, but the volume of examples that people are showing and the fact that I know that the way these probabilistic engines work that like, if one exists, they're doing 8.5 billion answers to questions a day. If one exists, more do. There are many people who aren't taking screenshots of this, many people that don't realize that this isn't cited source information as much as you want to trust Wikipedia. We all understood the operating rules of Wikipedia. We all understood the operating rules, frankly, of Google search results that point toward where that information came from. This is a desperate action by a company that doesn't know what to do with the, the re-architecture of how information discovery works in an AI age, and its communication couldn't have been worse. Essentially, fake news. The bar has been set lower. I already thought it was on the floor. Oh, George, that's a, a powerful, powerful response. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. If I didn't care about not cursing so much, this just would have been a string of expletives. Anyway. I am excited, though. I think it opens up the opportunity for real research. I think it opens up the opportunity for us to stop playing this game of SEO, of guessing what these robots want from us with links and playing their attention game. We, we can do more original research. We can focus our, our attention on our user experience more and what actually works in terms of creating content that helps people rather than helps Google better index the web. Too much of my brain power, I think, over the past decade plus has gone to knowing the intricacies and ridiculousness of the the overlord that the AI search complex there. And so as this empire falls, I, I'll be first in line to to grab a dance there. All right, Nick, I don't know. Did we get a feel-good story? Do we have anything we want to dig up? I don't have a feel-good story, but I could I could I could tell you some exciting news. 
myself and a bunch of other whalers here, here at Whole Whale t- to each other, apparently all five and six months ago, bought tickets to see Hosier this week. Hosier's coming to New York City. It's coming to, coming to Queens and Forest Hill. So a bunch of us will be there. And we're excited to support our, our Irish rock friend at Queens. There we go. I like the internal good news. All right, Nick, I have, I have a joke for you. Oh, okay. I, I, I could use it. I could use it. All right. Uh, why did the AI recommend a ladder for the nonprofit? I don't know, George. Why? Oh, it's because it knew their donors were in the cloud. Oh, I see. I see. Got to go up. Gotta go they up. go low, we go high. The files are in the computer. <laughs> All right, Nick. Thanks as always. Thanks, George.